This part of the workshop was a presentation by Jonathan Carr. Jonathan created Carr's Cider House here in Hadley, Massachusetts some years ago. Makes a delicious um, hard cider product and other apple related products. Um, Jonathan is doing creative things with his orchards and uh, I think you'll find Jonathan's presentation very interesting whether you're an orchard owner or not. Great. Hi everybody, I'm Jonathan Carr. Um, sorry, I don't have a beautiful PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> yeah. Um, so in any case, as Marilyn said, um, I'm the co-owner of a business called Carr Cider House. Uh, and we're based out of Orchard, just... Uh, <laughs> you look out the window, up on, up on Mount Warner, just behind us. Um, which we bought in 2002 and been working hard on. Um, it has about a thousand feet of frontage on, on Lake Warner and hopefully it's uh, largely a benign impact on the, on the water quality. Um, and so I thought I would just, I'm just going to touch on a, a brief history of, I guess, the land use of Mount Warner and changes in the orcharding and how we came to our particular uh, orcharding techniques. but. Um, So I just wanted to go uh, uh, way back in time, uh, because I thought this was pretty cool in case you guys don't know it, to the end of the last ice age, and there was a giant lake that filled this entire valley from Rocky Hill, Connecticut, up to central Vermont, and uh, Mount Warner, of course, was, a, was an island, an archipelago out there. And so, uh, you know, depositing fine sandy loam on these slopes and making it a, a lovely place to someday plant an orchard, but uh, yeah, talk about a watershed at that point. Um, and so, uh, in the colonial era, um, let's see, Marjorie, don't, don't be too hard on me, but they, the, the wealthy Porter Phelps Huntington family um, owned a lot of the land up on Mount Warner, and we have written records of uh, mixed woodlands, orchards, grazing, and even cultivation of uh, rye grain up there. And so maybe that's kind of some of what Jason showed in his picture, the plot of land up on Mount Warner. Um, and as far as uh, our particular 38 acres go, and records show that um, the orchard was first planted in the 1860s by a couple of brothers by the name of Clark, who aren't related to any of the other Clarks that still have orchards around the Pioneer Valley, interestingly enough. Um, and they bought this land from Sophrenia Granger, who used to own the mill, own a lot of land as well. This was known as Granger's Pond up in that day. Um, and then according to um, Jesse Agassiz, who was born Jesse Scott over here in the farmhouse at the Boys Firts, uh, are now, now cleaning up, told me that the original orchard trees were planted with mud uh, dredged up from Lake Warner and put in the, the planting holes. Um, and as you know, historical photos show from that time, uh, Mount Warner was actually completely, like almost denuded of trees. There was a sheep craze in the early mid 1800s. And so perhaps there was some soil degradation there. Maybe that's why they needed to, to drag that mud up the hill to plant the trees. But um, so the, the, the land passed from the Clark brothers to the McCretzkys, who are also the Stockbridges, who founded a little school over in Amherst, and, uh, and to the Mitchell family, who some folks still remember, and the Atkins of Atkins Farm fame, and the Arsenals, and finally to, to us in 2002. And over these um, last 150 years, there's been a lot of changes in the way orchards are, are, are managed. Um, there's been this, big, this downward trajectory in tree size from giant standard trees down to, to dwarf trees. Um, and so the full-size trees would have been about 60, 60 trees to the acre. Uh, they would work with teams of horses and, and men with ladders. Um, and over time, you can actually have pictures of the, the landscape changing in the hill where they transition from these big trees and they set up terracing and planted these semi-dwarf trees, which uh, allowed um, hundreds of trees per acre, they're smaller trees, and it represented a, kind of an intensification of the embodied energy in the orchard system, where the, the reshaping of the land allowed increased tractor access and the uh, mechanization of the orchard tasks. And it also represented an increasing impact on uh, Lake Warner in the form of uh, runoff from uh, fertilizers and from orchard sprays. Uh, and, you know, that one time you had you know, DDT and ALAR and, you know, all kinds of things that were banned and you know found that to be bad, uh, um, but um, and so the, the the trend in orcharding had, at the end of the 20th century has been to turn apple orchards into kind of glorified vineyards at this point, where there's 
thousands of trees per acre, uh, tightly spaced on trellising systems with herbicide strips and you know, complex uh, spray programs to ward off pests and diseases. Um, and under the right conditions, these are extraordinarily productive systems, but they're also very you know, capital, chemical, labor intensive. Um, with you know the drawbacks that these intensifications produce, uh, so as we see the you know the apple tree size shrinking in orchards over time, we also see a concurrent growth in inputs and resulting like environmental uh, problems from that. And so, in that tradition, we planted 1,600 uh, dwarf trees in 2006, and it, it didn't it didn't go very well at first for us. Um, and so, we don't actually we don't. We don't spray. I, I don't. I don't like spraying. I got kids running around. I have, I have skepticism about the health of, of sprays. So uh, we planted uh, pest and disease resistant apples um, instead. Some of them modern ones that were developed for the, the P P Purdue Rutgers uh, uh, consortium, and um, it reduces yields. And the apples are ugly, but uh, it doesn't matter because we're squeezing them all into juice and fermenting it or turning it into you know, cider products. And so it's a, it works for us. You know, if you're growing table fruit, you can't you can't do that. Um, and so we don't use uh, chemical fertilizers either up there because that has a, a detrimental effect on uh, hard cider when it ferments. So we want to slow down the fermentation. That speeds it up. But in any case, never mind all that. The hungry deer we had a field day with our trees. They they roused all the fruit buds, stunted a lot of them. I, you know, I took pot shots with a shotgun. I, I Encouraged hunters that I, uh, I built a crazy 3D electric fence that was supposed to confuse them. It didn't work, but in any case, we couldn't afford an $80,000 woven wire fence, uh, and so we decided to change our entire approach to orcharding, orcharding because of this, uh, and move away from the modern dwarf orchard system. Um, and so I learned that in Europe and in many parts of the world, there still exist these types of orchards which incorporate. Uh, fruit or nut trees, but uh, with grazing animals beneath them. Uh, and this is known as a silvopasture or agroforestry, as John mentioned. Um, and in fact, in northern France, particularly in, uh, in the cider dairy region of Normandy, they have these orchards called uh, otige or high stem, where they uh, graze cattle and sheep and they make both amazing hard cider and amazing cheese. So it's very inspiring, but it also has, it has multiple benefits. You reduce mowing, you Use of fossil fuels improves soil fertility and sequesters carbon um, and provides additional farm products in the form of dairy and meat. So it's a diff diversification for your farm as well, which is important. Um, so we've decided that we're going to emulate these European orchards uh, by planting lower tree densities per acre, ranching high up out of reach of grazing livestock and nibbling deer, and um, we're also working on uh, experimenting with blocks of high-headed semi-dwarf trees at higher planting densities um, to see if this hybrid approach is, is feasible as well. Um, and then we're going to be bringing in rotational grazing with a small mixed flock of uh, sheep and goats as well uh, at very low stocking densities, so nowhere, nowhere near the lake. Um, and so, you know, we've come full circle in our practices, I think, but, you know, we're trying to put a, a modern twist on these traditional techniques in ways that are going to be gentle on the land and uh, certainly contain nutrients flowing down uh, into the watershed. And, um, you know, I'm not sure if this is going to be a viable and productive system, but I'm betting on it with my, with my money and my land. And I think it's going to be good for Lake Warner, too, keeping nutrients where they belong, uh, in the orchard and out of the lake. Um, and so I just, you know, I invite you to uh, come up. You can actually access our land through the um, Trustees of Reservations Trail. There's a trail off the corner that goes off and you get a great view and see what we're doing. We don't, we don't run off folks who wander through the land. Um, and so, yeah, I, I hope it goes well and you'll be hearing more about it in the future. I did, yeah. So, 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 well, in a combination of uh, grants we got, some through the uh, Hamden, New Hampshire Conservation District, and some through uh, the state, um, we were able to remove a lot of old diseases uh, over around the orchard uh, and get uh, 
cover crop, develop, uh, put in uh, new fields with, with uh, clover and grass and to get rid of this the kind of a poison ivy understory that we had going there. Um, and so that's been going really well. We're initiating a replanting program just in the middle of putting about 500 trees in this, this spring. Um, so yeah, it it's definitely looks like a different place than it used to about five years ago. Um, the clover and the grass were enough to push out the poison ivy? Actually, no, and, and Ms. Food wouldn't like this, but you have to till the land a lot. You have to, you have to go in there, you have to harrow it, you've got to plow it up, you've got to kill the perennial plants that are in there. And then you, then you put in the good guys after those, those plants are dead. Well, poison so, ivy in particular is yeah, very pernicious. It <laughs> is, but I don't like being put on the harrow, so that's, that helps. Okay. Hey, hey. Sorry, John. Do you find any certain varieties that, oh, certain sure. varieties of apples that are <coughs> doing really well for you? Um, we, well, interestingly, you know, we planted a combination of modern disease resistant apples and some really old traditional American apples like Baldwin and Golden Russet. And I, you know, the old, the old school apples are holding their own against the modern ones, so, which is fascinating. I think the modern ones maybe have been selected to be in systems where they're fertilized a lot, sprayed a lot, and you know, kind of caught them. Whereas the old ones had to develop, you know, they, they had to be good apples no matter what back then because they didn't have a lot of support. Uh, mm -hmm. So, what are some of those, John? The, the, the older ones. Oh, the older ones. Well, in particular, Baldwin, Golden okay. Russet, uh, you know, those, those are standouts for us right now. Um, yeah. Jenny? What did you do with all the trees that didn't make it? Did you have to dig them up? And we chipped them. They, yeah, they, they, they wanted to burn them, but I, I, wasn't, I didn't like that idea. So, uh, yeah, we chipped them. So we have a lot of uh, apple mulch right now. We're just, just going to redistribute it. Uh, yeah, use it to mulch around the trees and uh, be one and help yourself. <laughs> Once you do that high intensity <coughs> plowing and then sowing with the cover crop, you don't yeah. have to go back and till it again. No, but, you know, if, it, if it goes well, you don't. Then, then yeah. Right. So, yeah. Um, is there one more question? Yeah. Yeah. Cheese about whether you're going to make cheese. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs>